Hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, thanks so much for joining us for this reading and conversation with Bruce Byers about his book, The View from Cascade Head, Lessons for the Biosphere from the Oregon Coast. I'm Carly Latero with the Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the Written Word. And we're based in Corvallis at Oregon State University. And of course, we're all working from our home offices this evening. And um, now it's my honor to introduce uh, our, our guest this evening, Bruce Byers. Um, Bruce has really deep roots in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest, but he is joining us this evening from Falls Church, Virginia, um, where it's already 10 o'clock in the evening. Um, so thank you so much, Bruce, for staying up late with us tonight. Um, it's, it's kind of hard to to introduce Bruce because he has such an interesting and varied background. Um, his master's and PhD degrees in ecology and evolutionary biology are both from uh, University of Colorado, Colorado Boulder. And after school, he went on to teach and do research really all over the world um, and all over the US from directing the Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies Program at the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Boulder um, to serving as uh, an American Association for the Advancement of Science Fellow for the USAID Office of Environmental and Natural Resources. Uh, he did a Fulbright Scholarship at the University of Zimbabwe Center for Applied Social Sciences. Uh, and he also nearly 25 years ago started Bruce Byers Consulting um, to work with groups across the US and around the world on ecological projects and research. Uh, and now he's the author of this wonderful book, The View from Cascade Head. Uh, the, the book is a fascinating look at the many layers of ecology and science and history and people of Oregon's only biosphere reserve. Um, and, and one thing that stood out to me in a chapter about gray whales, um, Bruce Wright writes, these whales stretch the scale of ecological connectedness and challenge us to think bigger in both space and time. They are a prescription for correcting ecological myopia of our own species. And I think that Bruce does this as well in his book. Um, and so it's really my honor to welcome him this evening. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Bruce. Um, and I also want to let you know that we are going to have time um, for questions at the end of the talk. And whenever a question comes to mind, you're welcome to use that little Q&A that you see at the bottom of your screen. And then um, I will be tracking those questions along with Shelly so that we have a really great set of questions to ask Bruce um, when he finishes up this evening. Um, so Bruce, I'm going to go on mute and hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, hope you can hear me. Um, uh, this is my first Zoom of this type, so I'm kind of a Zoom novice, and I hope that if something goes wrong here, Shelley will rescue me um, as far as either sound or screen sharing or anything like that. Thanks very much, Carly, for that uh, kind uh, introduction, and um, I want to welcome all of you. I'm having trouble seeing you out there in the virtual audience, but I know that a number of you are there from all over the country, really. And um, so welcome. And I hope that in these strange times, you're all, you and yours are all staying um, healthy and hopeful. Um, we'll get through them. But this, uh, this Zoom, presentation is something I wish I could be there in person for you and see you all there in the audience and um, see your faces and your reactions. But I will try to save time for some questions and discussion at the end here. So let me start sharing the screen with a picture that uh, is on the cover of the book. Um, thanks to a longtime Cascade Head resident, Duncan Berry, who agreed to share this drone picture of Cascade Head from somewhere over the mouth of the Salmon River. It's a view that to me would 
seem like what an eagle would see as it's flying over this distinctive southern point. I want to uh, start, I think, with a short verbal preface or introduction to the book. As Carly said, my academic training is in ecology and evolution. And um, I taught for about 10 years at the University of Colorado after my PhD, and then came to Washington to pursue these interests in international biodiversity conservation and sustainable development. Um, most of my writing, therefore, has been either academic scientific papers or technical reports for clients. But uh, about 10 years ago, I started a website. And as part of that, because I wanted to tell stories of my adventures in these wonderful places all over the world, amazing ecosystems and meeting amazing people, I started a blog and really got addicted to that kind of writing of sharing stories and telling about places, sort of creative nonfiction writing. And by now I've written about 130, I think, or more blog posts, but wanting to press forward with that kind of writing, um, I applied in 2018 to the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology to be their resident ecologist, ecology, re ecology resident, and was successful in that application. And I told them that I wanted to come out there for that three and a half month residency and basically use my consulting techniques and skills to talk to everybody I could who was involved with the place and its conservation, to go to all the places I could and see things on the ground and also uh, dig through the scientific literature online and also use some archival research if I could. And I managed to, when I was there, talk to more than 50 people, interviewing them as key informants. Many of them had been involved with the protection of Cascade Head for decades and decades. And it was a very amazing time for me. I ended up writing uh, these essays, or at least starting the essays there. And I've tried to weave together my own personal observations, the history that I was learning about, the ecology. And, um, and it's really, this is really, I think of it as creative nonfiction nature writing. So uh, it turned into this book, which thanks to the OSU Press uh, has just come out. And that's very satisfying. I want to do just a quick sort of visual tour here with the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here's that place from West Wind Beach looking north, looking down the watershed of the Salmon River with Cascade Head in this telephoto view about 20 miles away. So from the Coast Range Divide. In the upper watershed, there's a lot of commercial timberland, cornfield forests, as some people have called them. But there are beautiful fog drinking forests on the Nesquilin Crest, the main part of Cascade Head. Sitka spruce is a dominant tree after which the Sitka Center is named. And here's from the head looking up the Salmon River over some of the salt marshes in the estuary. Now, this place is Oregon's only um, UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. And it was designated as such in 1976. This is a replica of the plaque that uh, indicates its designation under the Man in the Biosphere Program. There are now about 700 or so biosphere reserves around the world. And um, these are supposed to be places scattered across the biosphere and its very diverse ecosystems where people can better understand the human nature relationship, really a laboratory for understanding human ecology in a place 
and a model for sharing that information about ecologically sustainable development once it's been gained by the, this research. And um, I've had a chance, I've been lucky, oh, one more thing here. Um, I'll talk about uh, the illustrator and map maker for this book in a, in a while. Nora Sherwood of Lincoln City made this map for the book that basically shows all of the key places that are discussed. And this again is a kind of oblique eagle's eye view looking onshore from just off of the mouth of the Salmon River. Now I've had a chance to work in uh, about 34 biosphere reserves in 17 different countries around the world. And I tried to bring a comparative perspective to Cascade Head from having seen all those other places. Um, this is, was from a visit to the Ascania Nova Biosphere Reserve in the steppe region of southeastern Ukraine. This is Przewalski's horse, which is a near extinct wild horse species. And here's from El Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve on the coast of Baja in Mexico, where these lagoons where the gray whales, the Eastern Pacific gray whale population goes to mate and to have their calves every winter. Um, so these are the same gray whales that pass by Oregon and some of them spend uh, their summers in Oregon. Here's uh, one of Nora's illustrations of uh, a fluke of a gray whale I saw just off the coast there at Cascade Head with uh, scars from uh, orca attack that it survived. Now, um, <clears throat> the idea of biosphere and biosphere reserves are really important in the in ecology and in the history of biodiversity conservation and the link between conservation and sustainable development. And I want to I, I treat that subject and its history in one of the essays called Old Orchard and the Biosphere. And I want to read you just a couple of paragraphs from that with some slides to illustrate it. While exploring a salt marsh along the Salmon River, I'd seen an old orchard on the property of a family that once used the marsh as pasture for their dairy cows. And on the way back, I stopped by. There were at least a dozen trees, each a different variety, it seemed, probably some of them old time heirlooms. I cut one of the bigger apples in half, partly to make sure there were no worms in the core and was struck by the contrast between the white flesh and the delicate red skin. My mind jumped to an analogy that I used a lot when I was teaching ecology. The biosphere, the sphere where life exists, is about as thick relative to the whole earth as the skin of an apple is to the apple. In other words, thin. The thickness of the biosphere, well, likely from the depths of the deepest oceans, maybe six miles deep, to the tops of the tallest mountains, maybe six miles high, 12 miles thick, that is, compared with the diameter of the earth, maybe 8,000 miles. The living skin of the earth apple is then not much more than 1,000th as thick, as thick as the planet is wide. If you look at the famous Apollo 17 photo of earth, sometimes called the blue marble photo, you can barely see the thin skin of the atmosphere around the edges. There's just something about that thought that gives almost anyone pause. Thin seems to imply fragile, or at least raise a question about fragility. The thinness of our biosphere is one reason that one of its species, having developed a technological culture, could significantly alter it. So <clears throat> this book could be categorized as 
creative nonfiction, nature writing, and nature writing is almost always place-based. If you think about Walden, for example, or uh, John Muir's My First Summer in the Sierra, or Annie Dillard's Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, or Robert Michael Pyle's Wintergreen, they're all based in a place. <clears throat> so is this, but a valid question is, how big is your place? And it's very, very difficult to try to delineate the boundary of any ecosystem because they're always permeable, permeable, permeable. And if you try to press outward to find the boundaries, really you find that the boundary is the biosphere. So each place is connected to the biosphere. Um, what I came to think is that Cascade Head is a microcosm and that although it's only a tiny part of this living skin of Earth, um, it's very illustrative. It has a lot of lessons that apply anywhere in the biosphere. And that's what I wanted to try to capture here is what lessons would apply anywhere. <clears throat> so for me, there are three big lessons. And the first is that people make a difference, that the actions of committed people who are trying to live sustainably in a place and protect its ecosystem, that ecosystem for their benefit and for other creatures really make a difference. And I look back in history at Cascade Head and you find people like President Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, the first head of the Forest Service. But you also find a lot of uh, people still living, uh, and I think some of them are probably on this call to tonight, in fact. So we should all thank them for their diligent efforts to protect Cascade Head. Second lesson is that even though there's been a lot of research and we understand the ecosystems there much better than we did. There are more ecological mysteries than we can solve, than we can possibly solve. And it's a moving target with climate change. Um, ecosystems are changing. So research will always be an essential part of conservation and sustainable use of ecosystems. We have to keep learning, learning, learning. It's a never ending process. And then finally, how we think about our place in nature or what I call our worldview really makes a difference to worldviews matter. And uh, they shape our individual behavior, they shape our collective behavior and and sometimes that, that's in positive ways and sometimes in negative ways. So worldviews are important and need to evolve as we struggle to sustain ourselves on this planet. Now, um, as I was researching and trying to write these essays and talking to people, I decided that there are five main themes that for me at least capture the sort of trajectory of uh, the history of Cascade Head from and its, its conservation and protection and uh, becoming a biosphere reserve and where it may go in the future. And those are resistance, let's see, on my screen, let's see, okay. Resistance, research, restoration, reconciliation and resilience. So five words, five themes beginning with R-E, re. Um, and I think these capture a lot of the uh, story. So I wanna start first with uh, an episode of this resistance against forces that would damage ecosystems at Cascade Head and this is what led to its designation as the Cascade Head Scenic Research Area in 1974. 
And uh, I learned about this really mostly from a woman who is probably in this group tagging along up the southern slope of Cascade Head behind then Senator Robert Packwood. And this was in March of 1973 that this group of so-called conservationists, according to the newspaper, trooped up the slope with Packwood trying to think about how to protect it. Here's a modern picture of, uh, of essentially that same site, a repeat photo. You can see the three rocks in the background there, those three rocks, these three rocks. And um, I, I found those newspaper clippings in the file of Ann Squire, who was one of those conservationists that day with Packwood. And they went out to look at the place and talk about it. She has an amazing archival file from those days and shared that with me. Um, so thank you, Ann, if you're listening here. And basically, um, this is from the Oregonian of the 10th of March, 1973. Headline, Packwood hopes to preserve the beauty of Cascade Head and it shows him hanging over the edge of the farthest cliff of Cascade Head. And um, the Oregonian story here, if you could read it, reported that just when they moved back from the cliff, a pair of bald eagles flew overhead. And so I want to read a little bit here um, from the end of a, or from, a, from an essay, the introductory essay called Eagle's View. Anne recalled that one eagle had swept up over the precipice very close and Malcolm Montague, the Portland lawyer and local landowner whose connections had gotten Senator Packwood involved in trying to protect Cascade Head said, look, Senator, even our national bird agrees that this area should be protected. Everyone on that hike that day took this visitation by the eagle as a portent. The bald eagle had been our national symbol since 1782, but its numbers had plummeted since because of the effects of the insecticide dichloro, diphenyl trichloroethane, DDT, which caused its eggshells and those of many other birds of prey to become too thin to incubate and hatch. Eagles were a canary in the coal mine, an indicator species who struggled to survive, showed us that something we couldn't even see was tearing at the fabric of the ecosystem. When Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was published in 1962, it is estimated that there were only about 400 pairs of eagles remaining in the lower 48 states. Seeing eagles at Cascade Head that day must have carried a strong message. In this place, things must not be quite so bad. How can we keep it that way? A um, little bit of a shift here. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll skip over uh, any detailed reading or talk about the research aspects, really, which are remarkable at Cascade Head over decades and decades. The restoration aspects, especially salt marsh restoration, which are tightly linked with some important research about um, salmon in the, in the Salmon River. I'll skip over reconciliation. There's a lot of healing and reconciliation that has to go on between people and nature and uh, between people and people for that matter, thinking especially perhaps of uh, the native peoples like the Kalapuya that Carly mentioned, um, the people whose land was taken away uh, from them. And there's important restoration and reconciliation going on with some of those groups in the Cascade Head Biosphere Reserve too. Um, but on to resilience, the last of these five terms that I wanna, or that I think uh, show the arc of history at Cascade Head. The idea of ecological stability has kind of uh, faded 
because the pl our planet and ecosystems are so dynamic. And really, it's been replaced with this idea of a very dynamic balance or stability called resilience, which I think of as something more like the balance that it takes a surfer to stand on a, the surfer uses to stand on a surfboard and ride a wave than it would take to stand still on a rock. So resilience is we, something that humans have degraded in many ecosystems. And to really come back into a sustainable balance, we have to help restore this resilience. And as a sample of that theme, I want to read a couple of paragraphs from the end of a chapter, an essay called Beavers in Pixie Land. And you'll just have to read the book, I guess, if you land and don't know what that refers to in the, in the Salmon River area. Um, beavers, of course, were in some places uh, wiped out completely by the fur trade in the early and up to mid 1800s. And, um, but they, before that, and even after that now, they're being restored here in these rivers and streams at Cascade Head and elsewhere. They are amazing ecosystem engineers, they've been called, keystone species really, creating wetlands and creating wonderful habitat for young salmon, for example, and uh, they're extremely important. And they're, they're coming back. So um, here's from that Beavers in Pixie Land essay. When I was out on the Salmon River in a kayak, looking for the layer of sand and mud from the 1700 tsunami in the marsh sediments, I found a piece of beaver cut wood on the riverbank. It was a nine inch long section of a three inch diameter alder trunk whittled sharply with neat rows of teeth marks, tooth marks to points at both ends and with the bark gnawed off in a spiral pattern to reveal the white wood. Just a small chunk of wood, like a little football. I wondered why a beaver would go to that much trouble gnawing through that much wood twice to make such a small piece. My scientific hypothesis, I think it was a beaver version of a message in a bottle sent downstream to say, hello, we're here. To say perhaps we're still here, despite what you did to us, resilient in this dynamic landscape that we shape and make still more dynamic as we have done across the northern continent since our ancestors were giants. We'll still be here a while longer. And you? Now, quickly to uh, talk about my roots in Oregon. Carly mentioned that. Um, my mom was, my mom grew up in Portland and I was born in Corvallis actually. So native Oregonian, uh, but I, we, we moved to New Mexico when I was one year old and I grew up there, but every summer pretty much we would take a trip to Oregon to visit the relatives there. And um, so uh, in, a, in an essay called Where Have All the Sea Stars Gone? referring that is to starfish, if you'd like to call them that. Um, uh, here's a bit from that that is sort of um, one example from the book of what I think of as a scientist memoir, or it's certainly memoir-like passages scattered through, woven through these essays. My fascination with sea stars started as early as I can remember. On summer visits to Oregon, my grandfather took me to the tide pools of Haystack Rock at Cannon Beach, where sea stars crammed in every crevice and crawled on every rock. I remember a special delight in their diverse colors, brown, orange, and some a deep royal purple, like the color of the robes of the ancient king of the sea. My granddad had a technique for 
um, boiling, salting, and drying a few sea stars we'd collect to send home with me as souvenirs of our time together. When boiled, they all turned orange like cooked crabs or shrimp do. We set them to dry in the sun, poured salt on their undersides, and scraped the shriveled tube feet out of the grooves on their arms with a knife when they were dry. For the trip home, my dad sometimes tied them, tied them to the bumper because they still smelled too strong to put in the car or even in the trunk. In dry New Mexico, they mummified quickly and for the rest of the year lined my bedroom windowsill, pentamorous radial suns shining their magical memories on me until next summer. A few would disappear now and then during the year if Blackie, our black Labrador, snuck in and snitched one for a snack. After I got a PhD in ecology, I remember blurting out when someone asked me, well, how did you become an ecologist? I said that it was all because of my granddad and the tide pools at Cannon, uh, Haystack Rock. Later, I wondered, did I really mean that? That I became an ecologist because of those experiences starting at five years old? And when I thought harder and deeper about it, all I could come to was, yes. Now I uh, returned to the Oregon coast for my PhD actually, and studied an intertidal snail at Cape Arago, south of Cascade Head, um, because it was a very good model system to answer a question that I had, the ecological question of, is behavior ecologically adaptive? And in retrospect, I've come to think that even then, I was really interested in understanding or finding the answer to that question about our own species. Because so often the behavior of our species does not seem ecologically adaptive or wise. But in some ways, I think um, pondering what has happened at Cascade Head gives me a glimmer of hope. And so um, I think there are some things that humans do that are ecologically adaptive. And one of those may be art. Um, since I was at the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. And again, I, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the opportunity that I had from them. I'm very grateful for, for the opportunity to be a, an ecology resident there. And, uh, and thanks also to the Howard L. McKee family, which supports that ecological residency there. Um, so, I, I wanted to explore this idea of the relationship between art and ecology, which I'd been interested in for a long time. And I explored that a bit in a kind of central essay, I think, in the book called Art and Ecology at the Otis Cafe. Um, the, the, this gets into the story of these wonderful illustrations that, uh, grace the book. This is the frontispiece by Nora Sherwood. I'll tell you how I met Nora in a second, but it's really, to me, very, very special to have these illustrations in the book because they feel a bit old-fashioned. Uh, most modern books don't have illustrations, and this has a frontispiece, a nice map, and 15 chapter heading sketches by Nora Sherwood. And I first met Nora when soon after I arrived at Sitka in October of 2018, she was teaching a weekend workshop on how to draw mushrooms. And she is a Lincoln City based artist trained as a biological illustrator. Here, for example, is her uh, poster of edible fungi of Lincoln City's open spaces. Note especially that bright orange lobster mushroom. You'll see a real one just here in the woods. Um, but I started talking to, with Nora about how could a visual artist really capture the ecological picture here because these fruiting bodies, mushrooms, 
which are so beautiful and delicious, are just the tip of the hypha, for, so to speak. The, the mushroom itself really is this gigantic net of thread-like hyphae or uh, the mycelium of the mushroom that goes underground all around and uh, synergizes, surrounds roots and shares uh, energy and nutrients with trees all around them. So it's a relationship. And, and most of what's happening is happening below ground. So in that case, really, maybe visual art can't capture this relationship very well. Well, I sent Nora a picture that I thought did illustrate an ecological relationship, a food chain. This is John James Audubon's portrait of the black oyster catcher, which is a kind of an indicator species of uh, rocky intertidal health on the Pacific coast and in Oregon at Cascade Head. So you see one of the oyster catchers jabbing at some limpets, which are one of their main prey. It's a fierce limpet predator. Nora, in return, immediately sent me back this illustration that she had just done of an oyster catcher parent teaching its chick how to eat mussels. So to me, this was a very tender and meaningful portrait, also of a food chain, but also of the ecological relationship of parents teaching offspring, which allows food traditions actually to develop in oyster catchers, feeding traditions, culture and animals, basically. Well, research at Cascade Head is longstanding. You wander through the woods and see things like this. Nora captured it in one of the chapter illustrations is this. Pickleweed is a kind of indicator species of healthy high salt marsh. This is a watertight cooking basket from the collection at Celette's. Oregon silver spot butterfly, a threatened butterfly of coastal meadows, salmon, of course, and the eagle again. Um, now, I think I want to end here. Hopefully, I haven't taken too much time, but Cascade Head, it turns out, was a vision quest site for the native people, the, the Nechesne tribe the Salmon River people who were a branch of the Tillamook language speaking group. And that was documented by the famous pathbreaking American anthropologist, Franz Boas, who actually spent a few months at the mouth of the Salmon River on Cascade Head, talking to these old, uh, the last few Tillamook speakers among the Nechesne. And um, he heard that the head was a vision quest site for these people. And to me, I guess in a way, now that I think back, the book itself was kind of a vision quest for me, looking for understanding, looking for hope, I guess, looking for meaning in a way. And so I just wanna read one little passage from the end of the first introductory chapter, Eagle's View. And um, just what did the group of conservationists and newspaper reporters see on that hike in 1973, I wondered. I couldn't stop thinking about that photo from the Oregonian that shows Senator Packwood sprawled on his belly at the edge of Cascade Head's farthest cliff, peering over. On a pure Sunday, I went looking for that exact spot, that view, a copy of the old photo in hand. I sidestepped and switched back down from the pinnacle to align the angles of rocks and cliffs exactly. Aha, here. I crawled to that same edge of crumbling rock where tiny stone crops clung, their rosettes of succulent leaves like little pearls above the dizzying abyss where blue water turned to white on the black rocks below. A minute was all I could stand of that view. 
so full of danger and beauty. And I inched back away from that edge and stood up into the strong east wind coming down the estuary, feeling a bit dizzy, overwhelmed and wobbly. At that exact moment, the eagle arced over on those huge, dark, wide wings. So thank you. That's all I have to say here. And I hope there are some questions as these foam lines on West Wind Beach seem to suggest. They do suggest that. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. Um, I can hear the round of applause from all over um, coming, surrounding us here. And, and we do have some questions and I invite all of you to add questions um, to the Q&A box on your screen if you'd like us to ask Bruce anything. Um, I'm, I'm gonna um, shift through and combine some things. Um, one, uh, Kathy Moore and Bob Pyle both ask a question that involves or, or at least um, speaks to fire. And so um, I, I'll ask you one of those. Um, Bob says that he heard that recent wildfires threatened um, Otis and he's wondering if the cafe made it through. Um, and I know, um, Bruce, you had coffee with quite a few people uh, and breakfast and other things in, in Otis Cafe um, while you were doing many interviews for this book. Um, and so Bob's wondering, um, what do you see as the future a fire at Cascade Head. Um, he says he knows it's been employed in um, Oregon silver spot management, um, but is it more of a tool or a threat in the long run or both? And then Kathy Moore um, also mentioned fire and says that she heard she's heard that coming um, come fall, the native people lit a signal fire on the Cascade Head to guide the salmon back home. And so she's wondering, um, what signals you think we're sending today? So uh, a little bit far reaching, but I'll let you kind of take fire as your guide here for this question um, and go from okay. there. Yeah, well, thank you for those questions, both to, to Bob and Kathy. Um, unfortunately, well, I did come to love the Otis Cafe and their uh, molasses bread and their giant cinnamon rolls and their yeah, all of a whole bunch of food. I'm kind of a uh, Americana diner uh, fan, but that cafe burned shortly after I left there in a fire, and you know was destroyed and closed. I don't know if they've been rebuilt. Not a forest fire, uh, so it was destroyed. I'm hoping that they're rebuilding. Uh, and anyway, the fires that swept down the Echo. Peak, I think it was called fire there, that came down the Salmon River was incredibly scary for people at Cascade Head, but it seemed to dodge and cross the river. Wind shifted just a little bit and it crossed south and went down toward uh, Lincoln City and the Otsu. Um, you know, fire, we have, we have to, I think we have a lot of reconciliation to do with fire in forests. Um, fire frequency in those for us, fire return intervals were 200 years or 250 years or so in the Coast Range forest, according to people like Jerry Franklin. And Cascade Head itself, the last big fire which burned, you know, was a stand replacing fire more or less of, of, of covered about two thirds of Cascade Head. That was the uh, Nestucca fire in 1845. A part of the area, the Nesquan Crest, which became the Nesquan Crest Research Natural Area, is older than that. The trees are way older. They didn't burn mostly in that Nestucca fire. But, you know, time's getting up for a lot of those, of those forests even, and people are living all through them now. Um, Ecologists, fire ecologists say that probably in most Western forests, because of our fire suppression policies and combined with climate change, but just fire suppression alone, there's probably a fire deficit that we still will have to pay back. So we have to uh, 
you know, we have to reconcile ourselves with fire and come to see it, I think, for its ecological benefits. On those Cascade Head Meadows, fire has been used by the Nature Conservancy as a uh, tool, a management tool to maintain the habitat for the silver spot butterfly. And as Kathy mentioned, um, there are stories that either at Cascade Head or probably more likely farther south on some of these headlands, that some of the people believe that you would send signals to salmon out at sea by burning the headlands. But I think those people were burning those headlands all up and down the Oregon coast, which in a way created good habitat for the silver spot butterfly for a lot of other ecological reasons, for hunting, for habitat for berries and so on. Anyway, fire, that's a great thing to think about and I try to deal with that in several of the essays in the book. Um, and, and what signals, just to follow up on that a little bit, what, what signals, you know, that, that was the signal at one point um, that, you know, the salmon were seeing, um, what signals do you think we're, we're sending them today? Yeah. Um, well, in my essay called So Long Silver Spot, I talk about going uh, up with uh, Debbie Pickering, the manager of the Cascade Head Reserve for the Nature Conservancy, and planting seeds on, uh, on a place that had been a controlled burn. And actually, a fire crew from Grand Ronde consolidated tribes of Grand Ronde came and helped with that fire. So an Indian fire crew um, and planting, re, replanting the seeds there, I think for me was turned into sort of a symbol of hope. You know, we're, we're trying to understand, we're trying to bring back, we're trying to talk to the ecosystem, help it. Uh, we want to see the silver spot. You know, we want salmon to come back. Um, we want to live in a healthy balance. So I guess to me, yeah, there were, I think some of the actions of people and what we're doing are hopefully sending signals to ourselves at least that we should remain hopeful. And um, thank you for that, Bruce. There, there's a kind of follow-up question to that, that um, as climate change shifts ecosystems, what should we try to preserve and what let go? Um, what's that boundary between natural and unnatural in terms of human effects on ecosystems? Yeah, that's a very good question to wrestle with, for all of us to wrestle with. So I tried to wrestle with that in a number of these essays. I guess the whole concept to me behind the biosphere reserve is that people are part of nature. Uh, we have to have, we should be trying to find a worldview that makes us see that people are part of nature, not over and above nature, but part of the web. And, um, in that case, then maybe not everything that we do is natural, but some things that humans do are natural. So for example, I think those coastal salt spray meadows up and down the Oregon coast are mostly anthropogenic ecosystems uh, created at least in part and maintained by humans, you know, pre-Indo, pre-Euro-American pre colonists, Native Americans using fire as a tool. And they created habitat that now we're trying to save the silver spot butterfly because there's been fire suppression and those meadows have been encroached and so forth. So it's, they're great questions to wrestle with. And they, the answers are partially ecological we need more ecological research to understand what's going on ecologically. They're partly psychological, partly spiritual, you know. How do we fit into nature? So that's a question to ask ourselves. 
And maybe then a, a good follow-up um, question to that is um, how have indigenous ways of knowing affected your worldview um, that uh, you, you write quite a bit about that in the book? Um, yeah, so um, especially in one uh, essay toward the end that uh, titled Dancing on the Shortest Day, the title being taken from uh, going on the winter solstice to see the winter solstice dance, the Nedosh ceremony at Solets. Um, um, I grew up in Mexico, as I said, so just down below where I lived were the Rio Grande Valley Pueblos, which have, you know, Native peoples living on in the same place for hundreds of years and not getting thrown off their land. And they had some very, you know, their ceremonies and their dances were something that I started being taken to by my mother when I was in high school or junior high. And they became a very strong part of our holiday celebration really going to the deer dances and the turtle dance and matachines and so you know i guess i felt embedded in indebted to native culture to a certain extent growing up in new mexico and um, it was such a deep experience to be invited to nadosh and to see that ceremony um, Earlier, I had thought I could read a passage about that, but it was a very moving, very moving ceremony, which I tried to describe. And um, I think we have a lot to learn from Native, both, both the you know, ecological knowledge of traditional peoples. The people there at Cascade Head were using you know, dozens, dozens and dozens of plants for all kinds of uses, and we wouldn't know how to use them for anything, practically. But also the, the native worldviews, I think, are something we might want to understand better and perhaps restore, so. Yeah, and I'll just echo that that, um... That is a, a really beautiful um, chapter toward the end of the book. Um, I also wanted to show folks, you, um, you know, you're showing some of Nora's work in your PowerPoint and in the book, um, the um, Nora's artwork is integrated in at the beginning of the chapters in, in a really beautiful way. And there's a, a question from Nick Wagner here um, that um, talks about, or, or is um, you know, asking if you could elaborate on how you see art as being ecologically adaptive. Um, you've done, I think, a beautiful job of integrating the two um, in this book, but I, I thought that was a great question for you. Yeah, okay, well, thanks for that question. That's um... It's, it's a challenging one, but I think there are some real answers there. John James Audubon, of course, uh, was a you know, transformative uh, bird artist because instead of painting stuffed little birds, he painted birds in their, in the, uh, you know, in their ecosystems and he showed them in many, many cases. Dozens of his books from Birds of America show a bird eating something. So for example, his bald eagle portrait shows a bald eagle ripping the belly, op ripping open the belly of a carp on the edge of a, a cascade. Uh, you know, amazing food chain pictures from birds. So he's he understood and he's showing their ecological relationships. But his art then triggered uh, really a bird conservation movement, of course, the Audubon Societies in the US, which started forming state by state in Boston, for example, was the first one. And then pretty soon, very soon, there were a dozen others in major cities. And they were such a big lobby that they convinced Teddy Roosevelt to create the first National Wildlife Refuge at Pelican Island to help protect habitat for the plumage birds that were being slaughtered for women's hats. So Audubon's art actually triggered an avian, you know, bird conservation movement. So there you go, art 
uh, is adaptive in saving birds' lives, I guess. Um, then the Hudson River School is another fascinating topic to me. And its association with Alexander von Humboldt, whose systems thinking was really at the uh, a root of ecology. Um, but Hudson River painters like Thomas Cole and uh, Frederick Edwin Church were fascinated by von Humboldt's views and their paintings were really almost critiques of the society at the time, especially somebody like Thomas Cole, who was also an essayist, talked about how important it was to preserve American scenery, you know, by which he meant natural, beautiful ecosystems. And so when I, you know, when I think about Thomas Cole and his argument about beauty, nature's beauty is something we need to protect. It's a national heritage. And then I think about the name of the Cascade Head Scenic Research Area. It's a unique designation within the Forest Service system. It's not just a research area, but it's a scenic research area. It was protected partly for its views, its beauty, its yeah, grandeur, sublimity. Thank you, Bruce, um, and, and thank you to everyone um, who, who joined us this evening. I know that there are more questions, and I know that if we were together, uh, you know, we would be able to linger in the room and, and chat with Bruce um, and each other, uh, and we miss doing that, um, and, and we hope that uh, we, all of us at Spring Creek, um, hope that you're well and taking good care in the winter months ahead. And we look forward to being with you, hopefully um, this time next year. Um, but because we can't chat with Bruce tonight um, or, or welcome you all on screen right now because of the limitations of technology, um, we did put Bruce's email address in the chat and he has said that he's um, happy to to chat with you um, via email or um, over the phone. So if, you, if you'd if you rather chat on the phone, you can email him and then he will share his uh, phone number with you. And um, I also wanna let you know that in case you didn't see this in the questions, um, that someone who says owner, so I don't know if this means owner of Otis Cafe, but they say that um, it is in the process of being restored and that the original front wall and the two sides have been salvaged but the rest is um, having to be completely rebuilt. Um, so Bruce, if, uh, if we don't chat with you on the phone or via email, I at least um, really look forward to having coffee with you at Otis Cafe some year here in the future. Um, I, I'm very grateful for the book and for you staying up with us late tonight. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who joined us from, probably from home, but from wherever you are. Um, we're, we're grateful um, to stay connected with you in this way, and we hope to see you on Wednesday evening um, and in the months ahead. So thank you, Bruce, and thank you, everyone. Thank you all, and thank you for hosting this, Carly and Shelly and the other sponsors and Sitka and the McKee family. And I really would be happy to visit by email or phone or however with anyone who's interested in this. I hope you enjoy the book and are challenged by it. So let me know. Good night.